They break, they steal, no one here is free. Here they come, they come for thee. Unless you listen to David Stacy. Welcome back, everyone. This is Dave from Core Productions, the Deep Dive TV podcast with my co-host Stacy here to talk about from Season 3, Episode 9, titled Revelations Chapter 1. The episode description reads as follows. Tensions are an all-time high, all time high as the town residents learn that one of their own has gone missing. The episode teleplay was by John Griffin, with a story by Jeff Pinkler and John Griffin, directed by Jack Bender. Before going any further, I'll tell you a couple things. One, this is not a sport free podcast, so if you haven't watched the episode, I highly recommend going to check it out, and then come back and give us a listen. Secondly, if you're listening to one of the platforms of this podcast, now available on, which, by the way, includes Apple. I re- recently put our podcast there. I finally figured out how to do that. And feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Corn Productions, where additional content can be discovered. If you're already on my YouTube channel, please like, share, and comment, and subscribe to our channel. All right, shout-outs this week. All right, what do we got? Well, I actually have uh, quite a few shout-outs this week, or at least a lot of a lot of comments from the same people. Okay. Uh, I'm, like, uh, not including everything that they said. But Papa Rocks, because they, th- these comments were uh, a, a lot this week. Papa Rocks says, uh, By the way, the podcaster voices are very soothing and appealing to listen to. An hour-long podcast. Love it. Love the way you to analyze and bounce off ideas. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, he also went on to basically, he thinks the whole jukebox thing that it being repaired is basically a continuity error. Uh, we kind of think that maybe it's self-repaired. That the, I think it's intentional. I don't think they would have just forgotten that they smashed it, right? Mm-hmm. Now, there's been a lot of chat about that online, too. People saying, oh, well, they're on every table. It's a different one. But no, it definitely was the same table. That's right. the point. Mm-hmm. Yes, they're on other tables, but this was the same table that he smashed that made the song for Acosta. Gotcha. So, and I'm pretty sure, actually, that's the only one that we ever hear playing. Mm-hmm. That, you know, the one <clears throat> right to the to the left of the door. Come to think of it, you're right. Yeah. So, uh, oh, and as far as Tilly, my take is simple. The place hates hope. Uh, Tilly was very hopeful this episode, very positive. The evil entity despised this and inhabited uh, Fatima and forced her dark side to surface and kill Tilly. Uh, this, thus, the rule was fulfilled. Hope leads to death, which leads to despair. The compound from Bill thrives on is despair. That's his take on the situation. Okay. Latrice says, "I feel like I've missed." Noticing a lot regarding the fandoms, frustrations you guys mentioned, since I mostly stay on YouTube. She is not part of the fandoms in the Facebook groups. Yeah, you know, Facebook groups are always the downfall in every fandom. Mm -hmm. Like, Facebook is where the most horrible stuff happens. We don't see it on Twitter. I mean, I don't know about Reddit. I stay off Reddit. But I've I've noticed with every fandom, it's the Facebook groups that just become nasty. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, she says that I only visited the, the from Reddit a little in the past week or so. In fact, I've never actually been so involved in the fandom for any of the previous Mystery Box shows I've seen. But I always, I, I really appreciate you two and your perspectives and positivity. Uh, just some of the reasons you guys are my favorites and I must watch for from content. Thank you, Latrice. Yay! <laughs> uh, Gerald, new person who's commenting. Hi, Gerald. Says... I'm in the camp that is frustrated by the lack of forward progress on answering at least some of the raised questions or mysteries. I'm looking for. I'm not looking for everything to be answered, but just a few of the things at least. I'm enjoying the show, but I think the slow drip approach might be just a tad too slow currently. Still, the acting is enjoyable, loving the lore and mysteries, and I will definitely always rush to watch new episodes. Gerald, when I'm talking about not having sympathy for the uh, the, the fandom's complaints... Uh, I, Gerald is not necessarily who I'm talking about here because he does say that he basically he does enjoy the characters and the acting and all that right. stuff. And I get being frustrated by the slow drip mystery box type of show. I get that. That's not necessarily uh, not necessarily for everyone the pace. But right. um, as far as answers are concerned, I know for a fact that some are coming. And in fact, by the time you've watched this, you've already seen some of those answers play out. Right. By the time you guys yes. get where we're at right now, episode yep. nine. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yo, yo. We're, we're, we're there. Yes, uh, yes. The basically. season is, is getting somewhere. Yep. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, you know, people are going to complain that we wait till the end to get anywhere. But, I mean, that's every episode can't be a big reveal because we'd run out of things to reveal. Right. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I, I, I don't think you ever watched the show The Wire, but I'm sure you've heard of it because I, I brought yeah. it up a couple of times. But The Wire was, uh, its approach to television was that each episode was like a chapter it, it was basically each season was a novel and each episode was a chapter in that novel so you couldn't really judge individual episodes until you got to the finale mm -hmm. because then you would see the bit all the whole big picture for that season right in the story that they were trying to tell i feel that this show is very similar to that in that you that each week is a chapter and not every chapter is going to be action-packed you know monsters all the time right that's just not what the show has been or ever was yeah well you know that the people that that bother me the, the ones that, that are talking about it in the light of like oh if this doesn't end this season i'm not coming back i want the show to end right i want the final answer right now and that's all they want right well, I don't care about you because we don't want the show to end. We right. want the show to keep going. Yes, yes. Like we're enjoying the show. Mm -hmm. We're not eager for it to end. Right, exactly. Yes, we want some forward momentum. And I think we're going to get it. I think, I we're think definitely, we are getting we're it. We're definitely at this getting point. it. But I don't want it to be over. What fun is that? No. Why no. would you want something that you love to end quickly? Right. And I, I don't those want, are the kind I, I, of people yeah. that I, I just don't think this is the genre for them. Mm hmm. I don't want it to drag on forever and, you know, like, ruin its legacy in the process. I want it to only have as many seasons and episodes as it needs to tell the yeah. story that they're trying to tell. Tell the story that, yes, that they but, want to tell. Yeah. And if you're along for the ride, great. And if you don't want to be, then, you know, no one's forcing you to watch it. <laughs> I think this is a good time to transition into the episode seven, um, the reception for that episode. What do you got for, for that? Um... The biggest topic I've seen people talking about is uh, the body that Elgin found in the secret room in, behind the closet. I don't know how to describe this place. Mm. So we found a body. We didn't talk about it too much, right? We were right. kind of like, well, who's that? But mm. we didn't really speculate too far. Well, the audience uh, this week has been speculating mm. a lot. And uh, I've seen theories. I've seen theories all over the place. Um, everything from it's Jade. You know what, uh, that actually... That the, the shirt, the striped blue and white shirt is similar to the shirt Jade was wearing when he first arrived and went into the root cellar. That actually seemed to be plausible to me. Based on the show does look very... Uh, the way that this show works, anything is possible. Right, Literally yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, people are comparing the shirt and they're looking at like, where's the pocket? And, and I don't know. Could it be Jade? Sure. Am I convinced this Jade? No. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Right. It could be anybody. There's a very good chance it's not somebody we know. Um, but, you know, the fandom is that everybody is everybody and everything we know, we already know. And they refuse to accept that other people or characters exist than, like, five people that we just keep talking about. Yeah. Um, other people suspect it's Martin. I don't know, because everybody's Martin, right? Right, Who yes. isn't Martin? Yes. Um, now, that I, I can see that being plausible, too, because... Mm. I think I might, I might be Martin. <laughs> well, remember the thing with Martin uh, was if we're comparing him being in the chains to our three being in the chains, their actual bodies were somewhere else, right? Mm. Their actual beings were in bed in a coma while they were in the chains. So if Martin's in the chains, is that not really his body? Well, where is his actual body at? Right. For who knows how many years he's been chained up. Right. Um, it suggests that he's physically in a different place. So could that be his body and he was in that room the whole time? I mean, I, that it's, makes sense. It's possible. Yeah. Sure. Um, but again, it, no real proof of this. But the idea that his body should exist somewhere else other than there is a thing. Mm. Uh, let's see. People are suggesting it's Christopher. I don't know why. <laughs> Just because we don't know what happened to Christopher. I mean, that's... That's that's fair. Yeah. But I don't see any evidence pointing that that is Christopher. Right. And I saw some people that seemed pretty positive it was, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, Tilly. They think it's Tilly's body. Okay. <laughs> I mean, at this point, you can just 
it's your body. You've been you're the one that's actually dead there. I mean, like it could be literally anyone. Well, maybe it's Elgin himself. <laughs> I mean, that would not surprise me. I, I I am having a hard time seeing Elgin surviving this season. Oh, I know, right? Yes. Like, what's going on? What's going to happen to him? Like, he's not. I'm not even sure that I want him to at this point. <laughs> like this ep this the, the last couple episodes have completely well, recontextualized his. You know character something I have to say about him in in context of tonight's episode that we'll we'll get more into, but I do feel like he's being deceived. Oh, I, I do I'm feel like that he, he thinks he's making good decisions. Right. He has reasons behind what he's doing. He's not an evil person. Mm. He's just being really, really manipulated. Yes. Uh, but back to the body. Other people are saying it's the real Victor who died in the root cellar. And the Victor that we know is just an entity impersonating him. Yeah, I have heard that theory. Yeah. That's uh, pretty out there. Uh, but, you know, we have seen entities impersonating people. I mean, sure, absolutely. So, I don't know. All right, so. I probably think that it's not supposed to be anybody we know. It's just a body. Right. Uh, so I saw a lot of negativity about uh, last week's episode. Uh, people were kept Being saying. Being episode 307. 307. Yeah. Specifically, yes. Because the, when we're recording, the right. audience hasn't seen 308 yet. So, yeah, a lot of people were like, oh, this is a filler episode. Okay, first of all, you're misusing that term. It's A filler episode is just. Like, you know, filler the, episodes don't exist anymore. Right. Filler episodes were when we had 26 episodes a season. Right. Yes. So uh, we weren't exactly super high on episode seven ourselves. We suggested it was a connective tissue type of episode. It's building to something. Right. It's So that's not filler. And there's still plenty of character moments that make this not filler. Right. Like people were saying that episode two, which was basically um, an hour long, um, you know, funeral for Mrs. Wu, the character of Mrs. Wu, was filler. Like, at this point, people who are saying stuff like that, we're, we just don't see eye to eye. We're not looking for the same things in our entertainment. Yeah. Because to me, that was a beautiful episode dealing with the death of Mrs. Wu and the ramifications from that, both for Kenny, for Boyd, for everybody. And I thought that was an absolutely necessary episode that, that absolutely does not go under the definition of filler. I did see some weird things where Tilly, uh, when Tilly was dying, and she said, you better run. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were questioning what she meant by that. Yeah, and well, I remember I questioned it on my first watch through. I mean, sure, but... And the then I changed my opinion right. by the second watch through. Right. And you know what? A lot of people are only watching once. Fair enough. So I get it, if they had this initial thought. Fair enough. It just seems like it seems self-evident to me, like, what that means. It means you just killed me. You're in danger. You better run. Yeah. And they're just looking for deeper explanations for well, that. But, you know, it could have a deeper explanation. I mean, it because could. Because in this show, anything could. I mean, it you could. You never know. <laughs> Sometimes I think they are, they get too lost in the weeds that they're yeah. overanalyzing these small moments that well, they're Yeah, you can't see I the mean, forest for the trees. Right. Yeah, there well, we go. We've literally, like, it's been a theme in the series. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, do we have anything else to say about the reception for episode seven? Uh, I don't. Okay, so moving along, Stacey, your thoughts about this week's episode. Uh, episode nine. Uh, it was great. Yes. A uh, 57-minute episode, so it's another extended one. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that means we're going to see at least one comment of somebody saying, oh my gosh, why was it so short? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because always. Yes. Um, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And I was sad. Upset that it ended because I want to watch the next one. Right. And, and now you can after we, we have, finish this you know, podcast. We have a rule yep. here that we don't move on to the next episode, even though we have them all. They're they're in our inboxes. Uh, but we keep ourselves from watching the next episode until we talk about the last one so that we can, you know, have an honest and open discussion about episode nine without the influence of actually we know more. Right. Right. So when we talk about episode nine, we haven't seen episode 10 yet. Right. We're talking strictly off of what we know based on this episode. Um, but yeah, it was like, oh my goodness, can I watch 10 now? <laughs> like, do you want to come over right now and record so that we can watch <laughs> the next episode? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because it's, it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. It's good. And we're finally getting somewhere and... I don't 100% know exactly how all this is going to connect, but it feels like it's definitely all connecting. Right, absolutely. All of these random storylines that make no sense, I'm now more confident than ever that they're going somewhere with this story. Uh -huh. They know what they're doing. Let them tell the story. Right. And uh, I, I feel like 
I feel like it's going to be satisfying, whatever whatever they're doing. I, I believe so, too. I thought this was another great episode and a great season. I think uh, we're due for a great season finale. Yeah. Hopefully not series finale. Hopefully it does end up getting renewed for season four. Because I would just be heartbroken if the series ended up getting canceled. Yeah. Let's uh, not even joke about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, like, oh, so Elgin. Elgin becomes an effective villain without meaning to be a villain at sure. all. Like, I'm just watching him throughout this entire episode going, you son of a bitch. Like, the things that he's doing. Like, so, yeah, he becomes an effective... And I guess that's the point of villains. The best villains are the ones that think they're doing the right thing. Sure. Even if they're and, not. And, I mean, I guess, you know, they all do. Mm -hmm. If you look at their stories properly. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, everybody's the hero of their own story. Exactly. And, yeah, I mean, I'm just watching him the entire time and getting angrier and angrier at him every time he's on screen. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, uh, like I said last week, um, Elgin, I just prefer you go back to sleep now. Yes. <laughs> All right, so anything else to say before diving uh, in? We get lots of little cameos. Ah, uh, yes, People yes. come back, characters come back that we haven't seen for a while. I love mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as our main cast, everybody's in this episode. Um, Tilly has been removed from the main cast as of episode nine. So yes. she's no longer in the credits, Deborah Grover. Um, but yeah, everybody who remains in the credits uh, did make an appearance in this episode. Yes. Unlike some of the episodes this season that, you know, we were missing uh, people here and there. So everybody, everybody came back. No guest stars. Including Clara. We actually see, uh, see Clara's Clara Clara's back this, this week. Yep. yep. She's been missing for a few. She missed the last two. Um, she was not in seven or eight, but she came back for nine. I'm still waiting for something to happen with her. And I'm right. convinced it's going to, but it didn't happen this episode. We got one more shot for me to be right this season yes. <laughs> with her. Well, uh, you can guarantee that based on how many characters are killing off this season, that she'll, she'll have more of an appearance next season for sure. If she lives through episode 10. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about the people that come back as we hit them, I suppose. Okay. Diving in? Let dive in. All right. So the episode begins with Boyd and Ellis looking for Fatima. Boyd is advocating for uh, for going home and coming back in the morning. They're in the woods specifically. They're in the woods, yeah. And it's, it's starting to get a yeah. little dark. He's like, we got to call it. Ellis doesn't want to go, but then Boyd starts to not be able to walk. And he has to be helped along to uh, uh, basically continue to be able to walk by Ellis himself. Yeah, because he's having a, a Parkinson's attack, yes. which we haven't seen for a while. And actually, it's funny because during this past week, in the aftermath of 307, I've seen people saying, oh, what's going on with Boyd's Parkinson? Like, <laughs> did it suddenly heal? Right. Well, no. It's it's only been like a week, remember, right. since yes. like last season when he was dealing with it. People forget... <laughs> The time frame that they're actually oh, on in the series. I, I, I have trouble like, with that. But I've seen people like, oh, yeah. it's been three years. No, it hasn't. It's been three weeks. Right. Relax. <laughs> right. So, meanwhile, Fatima is in the cellar. She begs Elgin to let her out. He claims she isn't a prisoner. It's for her own good. But uh, it seems to me, Elgin, like this is, in fact, a prisoner She's definitely type situation. a prisoner. Right. Right? Like, she's locked in. She's chained to the bed. If you're not allowed to leave, then you are a prisoner. Oh, yeah. So uh, you might want to check the definition of a prisoner, Elgin. But she tells him that she saw a kimono lady as well. And what she had uh, said is a lie. The thing inside her is not good. Look what it did to Tilly. And Elgin says that happened because the baby was scared. Uh, that she wasn't feeding it properly, and she needs to stop fighting it. Uh, he wants her to drink her his blood, and she needs to eat. The more she eats, the sooner they'll all go home. And Elgin says the baby already helped them once. It helped him remember his dream, which led to Boyd... Smashing uh, the music box. Yes, yes. And, and she, they keep reminding us, like, yeah, that, that plot still happened. We're uh -huh. not throwing it away. Right. It's coming back. <laughs> and she reluctantly drinks, and then we have our credits. Yeah, she drinks Case just Rossella. a little bit from yep. the jar that he kind of forced in her mouth, and then after that, she was like, "Okay," and she very hungrily like grabbed the jar and just starts guzzling down <laughs> blood. Um, so kind of vampire-y? kind of. That we're literally drinking blood, right? Uh, after the credits, when we come back, Victor is freaking out. Victor has been really going off the rails the last couple of episodes. I know, right? Poor Victor. Yeah. And he, Not it, poor Kenny today, but poor Victor. Right. He hasn't slept in like mm. three nights. Um, he really desperately is was trying to get this doll to talk. Right. And now he realized that he was wrong about that. And he blames himself for everything. Right. Because he doesn't remember. And he feels like it's all his responsibility. Because, well, I mean, 
kind of like, yeah, you're the one that was here, so maybe right. you should know some stuff. <laughs> but he's being really hard on himself and has been and will be throughout the rest of this episode. So T Tabitha is trying to uh, calm him down. Victor says all, all he does is make things worse. He doesn't want to remember anymore. And he ends up weaving, but not before Tabitha ends up touching him. And she seems to feel something. Yeah, she, I, she has a moment is right. what I put in my note. She doesn't really understand what happened. Um, Sarah kind of asks her what it was, and she's like, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We'll know by the end of the episode what that was. We will. So Kenny finds Tabitha uh, to ask about or to tell her about Julia or Julie, rather, not my daughter. Uh, Christy and Muriel are examining Julie as Jim and Ethan look on. She seems fine. Yeah, no signs of trauma, Christy says. She tells them about the ruins that she that she says was a really weird dream. And Christy decides to keep her overnight. Jim asks what her and Ethan were doing there. And she ends up saying that she was out. Uh, she originally went, went out there with Randall, which is something that Jim latched onto. Yeah, which we knew he would. Yeah, and um, Julie so says he doesn't, he doesn't even listen to the rest of her story. Right. He's just like, "What were you doing with Randall?" Right. And Julie, Julia says it isn't like that. Uh, and uh, when Tabitha finds him, Jim says he'll be right back. And I'm thinking, "Oh Christ! For Christ's sake, Jim, we're not doing this again." Right. Like he didn't even listen to the story. Right. You asked a question. What were you doing there with Ethan? Right. And her story starts with Randall's name. And then, boom, don't want to hear your story. I'm going to go beat up Randall, right? <laughs> right. And that, that, I mean, it doesn't end up like that, right. but that's exactly where we think it's going right. to go. That we're going to have another Jade and uh, uh, Jim scene like last week. So, no growth for Jim. But it turns out that's not what happens. Yeah, uh, Jim was actually kind of a decent person this episode. Yeah. I, I, okay, so I've given Jim shit all season long and through the back half of season two. Yeah, but he does he does a uh, decent job in this episode. He should have stayed to listen to the rest of her freaking story sure, though, before sure. he did this. I mean, we're showing some growth, maybe not all growth. Maybe he still has uh, room to grow. I mean, he certainly does, but he's showing some yeah. signs of character growth within this episode. And all in all, I think he does a pretty decent job. Uh, so credit where credit is due. Uh, but Randall looks at himself in the mirror and starts hearing the cicada noises loud in his head. And it goes in the way in time when Jim knocks on the door. Yeah, but it was going pretty bad uh, yeah. before Jim knocked. Mm -hmm. He was like literally like breaking things because he couldn't deal with uh, what he's hearing and dealing with. But speaking of people who were undergoing character growth, uh, clearly shaken, he's still like, what What can I do for you? He's all polite about it. Yeah, I mean, he could have been the one to start throwing Right, punches. yeah. <laughs> so, um, of course, he wants to know about Julie in the Woods. Randall is not in the mood for the big bad dad. Randall <laughs> gives the worst answer he possibly could have given. Right. Okay, Randall, who's a 20-something-year-old man yes. who was hanging out with this dude's 16-year-old daughter. Yes. And Jim's like, what were you doing with Julie in the Woods? Yeah. Worst answer he could have given is what he gave. He says, well, what did she say we were doing in the woods? <laughs> like, that's not the right answer. Right. Not the right answer at all. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Jim says he, he doesn't understand what's going on with his daughter, but he thinks Randall might. And Randall explains that he was teaching her how to drive, which is something that Jim is surprised by. Like, what do you mean you're doing this really simple but uh, kind gesture? Yeah, they're both are surprising in how they handle each other yeah. in this scene. And I think they're both surprised at each other as much mm. as we are surprised. Right. And Randall explains that he, oh yeah, okay, so Randall says he uh, told her not to go back to the ruins, but can't say anything other than that. It felt like it was, the it, the ruins was just wrong. And the com he, he ends the conversation because he really can't explain what was wrong about it, or his experiences, or anything really. He can't verbalize it. It's too big of a thing, maybe beyond our human comprehension, to be able to even be able to explain. Yeah, and his, I his think experience. he's not ready to face it. Right. You know, Julie is trying to figure it out, and he's just like, I can't. Mm. I, I don't want to talk about it. I right. don't want to go there. Mm. Uh, as Jim goes, Randall gives him some advice. And this is the second time in two episodes that Jim has gotten some advice, and good advice at that. Uh, he says, teach his kid to drive. Uh, none, you can't do anything about the rest of it, and none of us are getting out of live alive so you might as well do the simple things uh that you would do if you were actually living if you weren't in this weird place right so don't just stop living because you're in this crazy you know from bill universe um and he says jim does not accept that he doesn't accept 
that uh, Randall's assertion that none of them are going to get out of alive. And Randall says good for him, and he doesn't sound like he's being sarcastic. He seems like he actually means that. Yeah, I think he <clears throat> thinks that's great that you still have hope, even though he knows there is no hope. Mm. So that's the end of that. Uh, wait, Not what I expected at all. I yeah. thought it was going to be another J. Jim situation from last week. Uh, yeah, he handled this surprisingly <clears throat> well. Yes. So Boyd and Ellis return to the station where he ends up telling him to sit down because he has something to tell him. Well, first he's like, it's getting dark. I gotta go ring the bell. Right. And Ellis is like, you can't even walk. They'll they'll live. Mm -hmm. You don't need to ring the bell. <laughs> right. But he, he's still very anxious to get the heck out of there. And then he starts to explain that he knows what's wrong with himself. Right. And Ellis is still like trying to get out of there and look for Fatima. Right. But he says to sit down uh, that... Uh, Fatima will still be out there in the morning. Yeah, she's got a talisman, right. so wherever yeah. she is, she's safe. And, and then, uh, he's finally about to let Ellis in on his secrets. Right. Uh, Donna tours Colleen House, where she has some flashbacks this season. We're, we're settling One, in for the night. They're not right. having a party tonight. They're no. all um, very... Uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? They're sad. That's not You're the sad? word. Okay. But, you know, Tilly just died. Oh, and, yes. And they're not partying. They're, right. They're just having a quiet night. So mm. we've got people setting up their sleeping bags and, and they're setting the cans at the door. And we're, we're watching their, their bedtime routine as <laughs> she's touring the house. You know, Jim rings the bell. This is her thing. She walks the house and just makes sure that the house is secure. And yeah, so she has this flashback, and it's literally a scene from uh, season one, episode seven. Yep. Fatima's party. Yep. Her uh, one right, year anniversary. Right before the massacre happens. Right. Yes. And it's it's a reused scene. This isn't new footage, but I love that we saw it. I love that they inserted it here. We even get a little Dale cameo. Yes, right we get uh, a flash of Dale, Trudy, Stacy, even Colony House resident number four. And this is before he had a name or a number, as right. it were. I, re I pulled him out of the crowd. I was like, look, there's number four. Yes. <laughs> uh, so these, he, these he's are, been there. He's been there the whole time. These are like your children. Yeah. yeah the colony house um, residents. No, 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 none of these people got credit in this episode. Mm -hmm. um, probably just because it is a reuse scene. Even the person who spoke, and I don't know, it was another colony house resident number, whatever, that spoke. But it wasn't somebody who got credit in this episode. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that is just because it's a canned scene that they right. that they reused. But yeah, Dale was there and Trudy. And like I said, Stacy, I, did she die that night? Because we haven't seen her again. I don't remember. She must be one of the 14 people that died. Must be. So uh, she, uh, in the present day, she her eyes missed up. And she's clearly nostalgic and sad because she knows what Fatima has done. And this is right on the heels of her telling uh, Boyd that if Boyd doesn't come forward and say what Fatima did to Tilly, that she's going to do it herself. Right. So she's thinking about that. Right. And if she wants to do that. So Jim finds Tabitha in the clinic at night and tells her, that uh, he's all in on figuring things out. He tells her he hasn't been doing a very good job, but he's all in. No more second guessing. Yeah, he's actually apologizing for how shitty he's been lately. Yes. So, good. Once again, some character growth. Right. And, and the whole family now spent the night in the clinic, we mm -hmm. learned. Um, not just Julie, not just Julie and Tabitha. And Because she was like, Jim, you could have taken Ethan home. And he's like, yeah, we're having a sleepover. So there's a lot of people in the clinic this night. Something I didn't point out is the fact that Julie and Muriel were interacting and Randall is in the basement. So all three of them are in this clinic. Right? And but, I was expecting them yes. to actually finally have a conversation, the three of them, now that they're all spending the night under the same roof. But it, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And, and Julie seemed uncomfortable with Marielle for some reason. You think so? Just a, there was just a I tad. Didn't, I didn't pick up on Maybe that. Maybe that was just like But a, I, I don't yeah. think they've really interacted so much. No. Um, I mean, she did a little bit. I've, I've been waiting for the three of them. Because yeah. the last episode, the last you know evening we saw uh, Julie and... and uh, Julie and Randall? Randall. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Julie and Randall were in the clinic, but uh, Mariel was at Colony House. Mm. So this was the first night they were all three together... And but then no, we we just we cut to morning before we see them actually right. interact. So, so Tabitha knows there's something Julie isn't telling them, and Jim of course knows that too. Uh, Boyd and Ellis, he's he's been told about his Parkinson's or about Boyd's Parkinson's, and uh, Ellis is pissed that he didn't know. Yeah, he he's finds out he finds out that Christy knows. And that, well, okay, but Kenny then, knows. Yeah, Kenny. That, and so that's, he's yeah. he's jealous. You know that yeah. you've got the boy has a surrogate son. But guess what? You guys weren't talking right. for who knows how long. I'm guessing a very long time until like two or three weeks ago. I mean, sure, that's the rational way to look at it. But from a human being with emotions, 
uh, it, it's 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 kind of natural to feel that way. Even, yeah. Even if it's not logical or he doesn't really have a right to those feelings, he right. still has them, if that makes any sense. Uh, but, yeah, Boyd thinks it's getting worse. He tells him about the monsters making him watch Mrs. Wu's death. And he thinks that this whole Fatima thing is basically just another means to break Boyd. Right. Um, and a mo- monster ends up knocking in the door. Uh, this is nurse creature, uh, Anna Sampson. Asking him if he's okay. <laughs> and Boyd, of course, reacts to this. He, he goes to the window, threatens her with a gun. Like, yeah. what is Boyd doing here? <laughs> and Ellis ends up dragging him away. This is very reminiscent of having to drag Fatima away from sure. in the same station. At, acting in this similar fashion. And you know what I picked up on? So this is the nurse creature knocking on the window and giving them trouble. She's doing this because uh, Randall's not in the bus. Oh, yeah. This is the one that Randall said every night would knock on his window. Hmm. When she came out, nurse creature. Right, gotcha. So because he's not there, she's like, well, let me go bother somebody else. So she misses Randall. That's sad. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, but I don't like nurse creature because she's the one that killed Tom. Right. So I'm sorry you're sad, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Sarah finishes fixing the snowman. That yeah, she's finally. Been, yeah. She's been working on this ornament for like two seasons. And then she suddenly starts hearing the voices. She starts uh, screaming and react. You know, it would have been really funny if she had finished fixing the snowman. And during this whole thing of her freaking out and uh, acting in pain, if she then broke oh, the stone. <laughs> that would have been really funny to me. But um, So Elgin uh, goes back to the cellar. Tabitha is trying to break something Fatima. off. Fatima. Wow. Fatima is trying to Tabitha's break. Tabitha's not there. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> Yeah, she's trying to break something off to stab like, Elgin Like with. a piece of metal. She's ripping off of the bed frame. I thought for sure this is where Elgin was going to die, uh, but not so much. She ends up attacking him. He easily bends it off, uh, and she fails to take him out and fails to escape. And then we cut to Boyd. Well, let's not forget to mention uh, what's going on with Fatima. She has a huge stomach all of a sudden. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever is inside her has grown. Mm-hmm. Um, we are no longer a few weeks pregnant. We are ready to pop. Yep, six months pregnant, uh, nine months. Eight, eight at least, yes. I would say. She is huge, all because she drank uh, a jar of blood. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's quite alarming to see that, that change happen <laughs> literally overnight. Uh, and, and he's yeah. even like, look, I told you once you ate. like, <laughs> Right? Elgin, you're a dumbass. But anyway, uh, Boyd and Ellis, uh, Boyd wants to organize a search party. Ellis is not having it. Uh, but that's when Sarah comes in. She knows about Fatima missing. Uh, the voices told her that Fatima didn't leave on her own, that somebody took her. Something she, took her. Right. Is what we were to- what they told her. Well, I don't know that that's, I, I'm not exactly digging Elgin this way, this episode, <laughs> but I don't know that way I would refer to him as a thing. But they don't know that, it, right. like, physically a person is responsible. Right. They don't, they, they don't know that based on what the voices said. That she is nearby, they are laughing because they will not find her in time. Yeah, and uh, they want them to know that they can't save her. So it's, I think it's important to point out that Sarah's voices are taunting her and and telling them, like, it's hopeless. Right. She can't be saved. Which says to me, they don't think she's going to survive this. Right. So... Unlike what Kimona Woman is telling Elgin. Right. Uh, I'm... So, it's... I'm not exactly certain about the fate of Fatima or Elgin by the end of the season. But I'm pretty convinced now that Sarah's voices and Kimona Woman's... Her entity deal are, are opposing sides. You think so? Um, not the same, at least. Okay. Like they're they're they were doing similar messages, right? Do my bidding, right. and everybody can go home. They were right. very similar messages, but the fact that Kimona woman is assuring Elgin, like she's gonna be fine, like it's it, everything's cool. She just needs to have my baby, and then you know you guys can leave. Right. Where on this other hand, they're taunting Sarah, saying, "Ha ha, she's ours now, and you can't save her." Interesting. Very different messages, you know what I mean? True, but it could still be coming from the same source, because in the case of uh, Elgin, they need Elgin to do what she's, what she's, what, what sure, he's doing. Sure, sure. And in Sarah's case, they don't, I don't even know why they're doing that in the first place. Why are they telling her anything? Because they think that they, they're, they, they're they, getting something out of knowing that they're helpless. They're using the people like a rat in a maze. So it could be, it could go back to one of our comments uh, from uh, Papa Rocks who said that the the place hates hope. So this could be another way of feeding into that. They're trying to make these people feel hopeless. 
Hmm. So it could be something along those lines. Well, but at the same time, manipulating Elgin also is like this could have gone bad for mm. for Kimono Woman, right? Because Elgin could have heard that this is what Sarah was told and realized that he's being lied to. Perhaps uh, it yeah. doesn't play out that way. No, but he could have got wind of this and been like, "Oh wait." Right. Something's telling you she's, like, not going to live because that's not what I'm being told. <laughs> so. Right. I don't know. It feels like opposing forces to me. Gotcha. All right. So, Victor is at Connie House com going completely nuts, throwing stuff out of his window, basically ransacking his, his little abode. Yeah, he throws out the pedal car, the croquet set, a bunch of peach cans, drawings, a sled, records, and... Basically hits two Colony House residents. And these are? Um, we have Colony House residents number 15 and 16. New numbers for us. Okay. Uh, oh. You don't have them? Well, I think I have an error in my notes. I have the Colony House resident number 15 is Anna Sampson, which is the same name I have for Nurse Creature. Ah, okay. So one of those names I missed. Because <laughs> oh, okay. I'm pretty sure they're not the same woman. Gotcha. No. I'll, I'll have to double check that. Um, but either way, whoever it was, I couldn't pick her out on IMDb. I only had the name based on the episode credits. And she wasn't in IMDb yet, at, uh, resident number 15, so I couldn't match her up. Um, 16 is played by David Rossetti. Okay. Who we've talked about. Yes, the name sounds familiar. He, is, he was the voice of Cal's dad in Sullivan's Crossing, oh, episode okay. 202. So we've talked about him very recently. Very recently. Yeah. Sullivan's Crossing 202 wasn't on screen, but he was a voice right. um, that we heard off screen. That was David Rossetti. Uh, he also is in two episodes of King and Pond, three episodes of Chapel Wait, and he's in the movie Bone Cage. Okay. Which we talk yes. about like a Endlessly. Lot, a lot. All right. Uh, so... Eventually, oh, so, yeah, uh, he's drawing the attention of the county house residents who he's, he's basically throwing things at, and Clara, and eventually Kenny and Acosta are involved. She won't get out of the way, but Kenny kind of gently pushes her aside so that Victor can just uh, go past her. Uh, I'm not totally sure why Kenny does this, but I think he knows that this is the best way to handle Victor at this point. Uh, Victor goes down stairs, grabs an axe, scaring the shit out of everyone. Yeah, Don, remember this is the axe that Donna like tried right. ripping the floorboards up right. with. Um, so it's in that little pantry area. Now, mind you, Acosta is instinctually reaching for her gun. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, her gun that doesn't have any bullets right. in it, Yeah, remember. exactly. So her first instinct in this situation is to go for a gun. So maybe Boyd wasn't wrong to take sure, away her, her weapon. But also, like... It feels like he could just start massacring everybody. I mean, fair. I, I, I get her, you know, desire to control the situation. And right. That is how she's trained to control situations. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so Kenny's trying to talk him down. Victor says he isn't going to hurt anyone. And uh, basically he says that just to let him go. And Acosta is like, not until you tell me what we're, what you're actually going to do. And uh, he says he's going to go chop down the faraway tree. Well, he says I'm going to chop a tree down. Right. And they're like, <clears throat> okay, but... I mean, we know what tree he's talking about. You right. know what? That seems like a really bad idea, Victor. Yeah, and nobody follows him. They just no, don't go. No, they're like, okay, cool. You're not going to murder anybody. Go have fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're a 50-year-old man. You want to play with an axe? Fine. <laughs> right. So Jim and the family go to the reopened diner with Bakta as the owner now. Uh, Ethan helped, apparently, cleaning things up. Right, and and she invites him to come help anytime he wants to yeah. help. Mm -hmm. um, which is sad, because he used to help Mrs. Lou. He did. Uh, they bring up Tilly. No one knows what happened just yet. And uh, we cut to Donna, who's looking at his her sister's picture. Boyd comes in. She tells him that she isn't going to say anything. The town can't handle it. She can't handle it because of what Fatima meant to them. Yeah, this is her, her takeaway after right. all of this thinking about Fatima. Now she's thinking about her sister. And, you know, I think the takeaway there is she does see Fatima as family. Right. Uh, Boyd informs them that she's missing and what Sarah said, and Donna says, fuck this place, and tells him to ring the bell. And they end up calling a meeting. Uh, I think this is actually a good strategy here. Yeah. And it's not Boyd's strategy. It's 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 Donna's. Well, Donna's. he wanted to have a search party, and sure. Alice was like, nah. Right. So, I think that whenever we have Boyd and Donna actually working together, mm -hmm. we have good progress. We do. They just don't work together a whole lot. <laughs> So Ethan is acting a little sullen. He, he's brooding. He says yeah. he doesn't, uh, basically, he misses Tian Chen's pancakes. I don't think he's a fan of Bakta's cooking. <laughs> no. Uh, and then he ends up going to the bathroom. Julie says that he blames himself for what happened to Julie because he asked what she should do. 
Uh, she she asked, asked what right. she should do. Right, that's what I meant to say. Uh, and, you know, she knows it's stupid, but she didn't know what else to do, who else to talk to. And the normal family outing thing is not working. It's just making things worse. Um, all right, so actually I'm going to pause here for a moment. Okay. Because it, it brings something up to mind. Uh, we had talked about how people did not seem to like Julie or Ethan as kids. And, you know, we, we, we tended to side with the idea that they're just normal kids. This is how kids act. Teenagers and Ethan not being a teenager, but being younger. <laughs> and um, I think part of the issue is that From has fans all over the world. Mm -hmm. And all these fans are in the groups. So what we're seeing here is a, a cultural divide. Maybe. Uh, that, uh, you know, some of these cultures see these kids acting in this way as uh, as a different thing that you and I do. Because this, this is our culture, so to speak. Um, so, I mean, like, this is how we expect kids to act. But in somewhere else, this would not be more acceptable, if, sure. if you get what I mean. So perhaps what we're seeing is just a different mindset than what we are accustomed to in the fan groups. Because we are seeing people from outside uh, what uh, our country so to speak. Sure. And even attitudes in our own country vary. Right. Uh, pretty drastically, depending on where you are in the country. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just I, I meant to say that at the beginning, but here's <laughs> as good a place as any. But anyway, uh, Chewie, okay, so they hear the bell, and Donna goes in and tells everyone to get out, uh, and because that they're, they're going to have a town meeting. Town meeting outside of the diners yep. where they're all gathering. Uh, Jim waits for Ethan, and I was kind of curious about this little moment. Like, are we leading up to something here? Yeah, because Ethan went to the bathroom. Right. But, uh, Just I was... so they could talk about how he's upset. Right. I mean, that was the point of that. Right. So Ellis asks his dad what he's doing. Yeah, because he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, he, he, what's happening? Right. He, he's <laughs> he's completely out of the loop at this point, and he wants he doesn't know what exactly is going to happen here. Are they going to out him him right. as, as Tilly's killer or what? But Boyd tells him it's going to be fine. Uh Boyd and Donna inform them that Fatima is missing right when Ethan and Jim come out. Boyd gives a rousing speech, which even seems to land with Acosta, who you might remember is not the biggest fan of Boyd. Yeah, and we have we meet two townspeople in this scene. Mm -hmm. uh, townsperson number two asks uh, if who took her is who killed Tilly. Uh, townsperson number two is played by Trina Cor Corkum. Uh, she's in Sharp Corner. That's the new movie that Reed Price is in. Okay. Uh, she was in two episodes of King and Pawn and nine episodes of Chapel Wait. Mm. And, uh, of course, <clears throat> Donna says they don't know if it's the same, but they do know. But, right, yes. Uh, then Boyd says, all we know is that she's close by. And townsperson number three asks, well, how do you know that? Right. And townsperson number three is... Dylan Bailey. Do you remember Dylan that? Dylan Bailey, name? yes. Okay, so this is our first credit for townsperson number three. But he is the actor who played the Civil War soldier oh, in okay. episode 106 that Jade sees. Right, yeah. The okay. one with the like messed up eye that was holding mm -hmm. a gun on Jade. Uh, and he also was Harold's uh, stunt double for multiple episodes. Gotcha, okay. So they gave him a speaking part here as a townsperson, um, which I don't know. In one respect, it's like, well, they th that happens in TV. People yes. take different roles, even within the same series, especially mm. when one of them's heavily made up or whatever. Yeah. But it's from, so is it possible that it's a bigger deal that we have the same actor playing the Civil War soldier and a resident now? Mm. It could be intentional. Right. You never know. It's probably not. It's probably no. just like he was on set. So <laughs> we, and he, you know, he's, he's in the union because they got to be unionized to, right, be yeah. to give them a line. Right. Um, I don't know, but I thought it was very interesting. Interesting. Yes. That the actor who played the civil war soldier is now a townsperson. So, uh, they organize, organize a search party. Uh, Tabitha goes with Julie and Jim with Ethan at Jim's suggestion, by the way. Right. Cause I, Julie and Ethan both say they want to help. So they split off. Uh, each with one of their parents. I kind of think maybe this is another moment where Jim does well, as opposed to maybe arguing against this, which I think he might have done in the past. Uh, but Boyd tells Ellis that it's best if one of them find her first. Okay, but Boyd, then what? Right. You find her first, and then what? Right. It's going to be the same thing right. either way. Like, you still have to explain Tilly's death. Sure. They're not going to accept, oh, we don't know what happened. That's not going to, that's, that's not acceptable. Yeah. So what's the plan? You still don't have one. 
Although maybe maybe he could be worried that if somebody else finds her first, that she might she'll... admit what happened. Oh, uh, okay. Because she thinks they know already. Yeah. Maybe. So he thinks that by doing this, that uh, they will control the situation better. Yeah, I mean, and I guess that makes some kind of sense. But also, like, you just really want to find her, so maybe we don't worry about who finds her, and we just right. focus on finding her. But, okay, so he suggests that it, it, it's best if uh, Boyd or Elgin, or not Elgin. Not Elgin. <laughs> <laughs> Boyd and Ellis find him, but then he pairs himself up with Kenny. And I know why he's doing this. Well, he says we'll have a better chance of one of us finding her if we split up and we're two separate search groups. But what if Kenny ends up finding out information, like... I mean, sure. Right. But his thing is, well, if one of us finds her, we're better off. So if we split up, we're doubling our chances. And Elgin, being the effective son of a bitch that he is here, pairs up with Ellis to make sure he's not going to get anywhere near Fatima. Yeah, he's like, Weeding oh, him... do you need someone to search with? Yeah, weeding him on a merry oh, goose chase. Yeah. So and I was... you know what I love about the rest of this episode and this goose chase that we go on? Is we get to see scenes in, like... Every set we've ever seen on this right, series. Yes. Yep. It must have taken them forever to film this episode. Mm -hmm. Because we have little pairs of people literally everywhere. Yep. And you think each one of those was a day shoot. <laughs> I'm sure. So Fatima has finished changing her clothes. She starts experiencing labor pains. Her stomach's even bigger. Yep. She notices a hatch and thinks maybe it's a way to escape. Yeah, so she like falls to the floor and then she finds this little handle and she starts clearing the dirt away. So and I found this like... Like, what's down there? I'm so, right. We still don't know after episode uh, nine, but I'm so curious. So now we have a secret room under the floor. Yep. In the secret room that's behind the cabinet, that's in the closet, that's in the root cellar. How 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 many layers are we going to get here? Exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> are we going to get into the secret hatch and then realize there's another secret like, hatch? Like, does this just then... lead right into the caves? Right, yeah. Like, where... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Acosta and Donna are searching. And, Acosta, and that's a weird pairing. How did that happen? It's it's interesting though because it's hot head. Maybe with hot it's head. because Donna wants to take wants right to control with... Acosta and Maybe. make sure she's not like out there right. taking control of somebody else. Right. But yeah, I found it weird that those two ended up searching together. So Acosta is being a pain in the ass as usual. Donna reveals the info came from Sarah, which, of course, makes Acosta even more Yeah, skeptical. she doesn't understand any of that, what that means. Because right. we're not explaining anything to her. Right. Like, and Donna's even like, I don't got time to explain shit to you. <laughs> and it's funny because, like, think about when the Matthews came. Donna spent the whole night explaining everything to Tabitha. Yeah. Like, that's their typical routine, routine is they do explain things. But with Acosta, they're just like, shut up and, <laughs> and no. Right. <laughs> we don't got time for you. So, uh, Acosta says that she could be an asset if they let her be, that she's a good cop. You know, I don't know if she's a good cop or not, but it, she, she does have a point there. Yeah. She could be an asset if right. they let her be. Right. And so far, they're not letting her and be. And I think the problem just is there's too much going on. They haven't yeah. had time to mm. acclimate her properly. Right. Um, but they're just so annoyed with her that she even, <laughs> like, wants to know things. Right. Uh, so Donna loses her temper, saying she doesn't have time to explain the million ways the place screws with your mind. She says, you want me to believe that you're good at your job? Help me find Fatima. And Acosta says, okay. And Donna offers uh, that after the two of them are, are done with this whole business, the two of them can sit down and talk. And Acosta says, okay. Yeah. And, and you I, know, I do think that Acosta is going to be a great asset. And I do I'm think sure. she's going to get along with everybody and be very <laughs> helpful eventually. <laughs> So I would like to point out the fact that in the first season, Jade annoyed the crap out of me. Yeah. He's become one of my favorite characters. Yeah. Season two, Randall annoyed the shit out of me. Yeah. I really didn't like Randall. And, you know, it's not like I, I'm eager to be his best friend or anything like that. But, but he, it, he's grown. Yes. And in season two, he's been a better character. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're going to see a similar progression with Acosta here. Sure. Now, there are some elements of the fandom that once they, you know, they make their first impression, that's it. Yeah. Like, they hate Jade or they hate Randall, and that sticks no matter what happens. Uh, I'm not one of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I tend to give people a chance, and I tend to let... Uh, Except Jim. I mean, I, <laughs> hey, I've, I've even given Jim credit in this episode. So, you know, I, you know, I think maybe we're going to continue to see some growth. Maybe. So, you know, I'm giving him a little bit of chance, but he's had like three seasons of stupidness. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, so... Kenny and Boyd search. Boyd wants to talk. He knows Kenny hasn't quite uh, forgiven him, but his Parkinson's is, is, Parkinson's is getting worse. He wants to know that Kenny is going to step up when he's gone or too feeble. 
it can't be someone a hothead like Acosta. It has to be Kenny. Uh, he says that people live or die based on the decisions you make, and he wants Kenny to be the one to do it. Kenny says he's not going to take his badge. Uh, Boyd, is gonna, Boyd continues to try to make his point. But then he says, you know, I'm not going to take your badge, but I'll take that one back. The, the deputy want. badge. Right. He's like, if you if it's still available, I'll take that one right. back. So we're going back to Kenny being deputy. Right. Uh, he doesn't need to keep wearing that uh, silly uh, outfit. Yeah, yeah. No. He could just keep wearing what he's wearing. Uh, in my mind, because yeah, he, he looks he looks better like in these uh, in these clothes, in, in street he, clothes. Yeah. Than the yeah uh, the ill fitting two short pants <laughs> he was wearing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jade is hanging bottles on a tree when he sees a vision of Christopher. So he's like on the back of the bar, yep. hanging bottles on a new tree. And, you know, this supports the idea that Dead Tom had. Um, what was that, episode six? Mm. Um, where he was like basically talking about the second bottle tree, which was the first one we met. Yep. Um, saying, well, how do you know that's part of the original design? That could have just been someone like you trying to figure it out. And we're supporting that here because... Jade's making another bottle tree to try and help him figure it out. Right. Um, so yeah, he goes up on the ladder and on the, the roof of the porch, he sees Christopher and Christopher's holding Jasper. Right. And of course, this is once again, uh, Tom Payne reprising the role of Christopher. Uh, yeah. And of course, he's not impressed. He's like, okay, I've seen these shenanigans before. Uh, I'm not, you know, this is not doing it for me anymore. And then Jasper roars Yeah, he's like, him. try something new. Right. And, and ja then Jasper does the same old Jasper scream. Now, I'm going to point out this is the third time we've heard Jasper scream. Yeah. And it's the exact same sound bite every time. And do you know what else it's the exact same sound bite for? Was uh, Boulder Dude in the Root Cellar. Okay. When Jade had the vision of a Boulder Dude, which I think that was his very first vision, mm. it made the same scream. It's the same sound bite. So this is our fourth time hearing that scream. Now, um, it's here that I had, I was going to bring something into this discussion uh, that I'm not sure that I should. It's an idea that I've seen circulating that seems intriguing, but at the same time, I think it might be part of the leaks. Oh. I, don't, I don't have any definitive proof of that, but I think I, I uh, because I think uh, it was an idea of Kelly's. That she uh, is getting in trouble for because she's Kelly, of course, being our uh, our our sister from cast or our sister from podcast, who whose name of show is escaping me. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm a cyborg media or something yes, like that's that. It. Okay, so she's gotten a lot of flack recently because they think that she is the source of the leaks. Yeah, or some people are accusing her of such. Right, and that's gotten her. I, I guess she's had to deal with MGM Plus and explain the situation to them. Yeah. So uh, this this situation, by the way, continues to suck. Oh uh, yes. <laughs> and it's I would be bringing this idea up here, uh, but I don't think it's a good idea for me to do so. Okay. Because I think it might be tying to things that you know that uh, we aren't supposed to know yeah, yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then don't bring it up. And I, I don't even know why I said any of that. But... I know. So bring it up <laughs> next week once we know for sure what right. the situation yeah, yeah, yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Henry... Uh, so Jade nearly falls off the ladder right, after yeah. being screamed at. <laughs> yes. By the way, he's like, hey, "You don't do, you don't bother me," and then you know it scares the crap out of him. <laughs> so uh, nice, nice try there, being the big bad Jade. Right. <laughs> but uh, it didn't work out too well. Henry finds him and he says, uh, "Oh yeah, well, are you okay?" And uh, what, what were you reacting to? And Jade's like, "Nothing." Well, what do you? What were you reacting to that you, isn't actually really there? Uh, and you know, of course. Jade at this point has no idea about Fatima being the same because he's in he, he skipped the, the meeting. Yeah. He's like, I heard the bell, but you know, I'm busy doing Jade stuff. Henry is annoying him, uh, as he seems to do a lot. Uh, but he wants to talk about him and Victor. And then we cut to and of course this stops uh Jade for some reason. He seems to want to actually talk to Henry now. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting because I I I, I would think that he would not still not care about this conversation. Yeah. But you know what? He should want to talk to Henry because Henry might actually have some insights that yes. would help him. Yes. That Henry doesn't even know he has. Right. Because yeah. Henry might know stuff. He's the one who knew Miranda. He's right. the one who's seen the actual bottle tree. Like, maybe you should talk to this guy. Uh, Pick yeah. his brain a little. That's why his attitude towards Henry is so confusing to me because I would figure he would want to do right. those things. Uh, but, but he... he He's the type of person, he just wants to figure everything out on his own. Mm. He doesn't want people's help, even when they could be helpful. Right. So, um, Victor goes to the bottle tree with an axe, and he starts trying to chop down the, act, uh, the bottle tree. Yeah, the faraway bottle tree, like the tree. 
and he's told by the boy in white, who has a much deeper voice than the last time we uh, heard yeah, him. Yeah, so this is, again, Vox Smith reprising yeah. his role. And I've seen some people saying, like, oh, they recast the boy in white, like, during this season. They haven't. Every scene with the boy in white from episode 101 has been Vox Smith. Mm. He looks a lot different than he did four years ago. That's just how it is. He's grown up a lot. He looks a lot different than we he did earlier this season. Yes, because, him. you know, he's, like, in puberty. Yeah, yeah. That happens. It does. It does. <laughs> So, but it's the same actor, is what right. I, my, my point. We have not recast him. He's not a different actor. Same actor. Yes, he looks very different in all different scenes. And he's not supposed to because he's like some ghost entity. We address that right here. Right. Uh, so he tells uh, Victor that he can't do that. He won't explain. Uh, and Victor asks why he's begging for help. But he says he tried to help them uh, when he tried to explain things to Christopher. He thinks they need to figure things out for themselves. And Victor points out that he looks very different. The boy in white says everything is changing, and he also points out, by the way, that Victor also looks different. Yeah, Victor looks a lot different than he did 40 years ago, too. But Victor's like, all these years you look the same, why are you changing now? And that's a clear nod at, yeah, he's changing because Vox Smith is aging, right? Right, yeah. Um, And we're we're, we're shoving that off as like, everything's changing, look, it's snowing. Like, like, yes, things are changing. Mm. (laughs) Um, And I I just kind of really like that. Like, they're acknowledging I mean, yeah, we know that things aren't. This person doesn't look exactly the same, so we're putting it in the story. Doesn't gonna make sense, but we're acknowledging it. We're not gonna pretend he looks identical, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, they kind of have to do that, yeah. We, or they do recast him to somebody who looks younger. And why do that? Why, why do that? Yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, and you know what I found interesting about his story about, uh, you know, I tried explaining with Christopher, and that didn't work. And you guys have to learn for yourselves. It's the only way you're gonna understand. It's very. It reminds me very much of, uh, you know, the way Boyd and the town handle things. Mm. For say, when the Matthews came in, yeah, and he's like, "Well, just keep driving, you'll see." Mm. They let them go in circles for a couple hours right. before stopping them before nightfall. Like that was what they had realized is it's easier if you realize yourself that you're stuck before we try stopping you before we do what we did with the bus right um it's easier if you just kind of figure it out on your own and Mm -hmm. then we'll fill you in right and that's i feel like that's very reminiscent of what the boy in white is saying is if i just tell you it's not gonna go well you have to figure it out on your own Mm -hmm. so uh he weaves without telling victor very much uh, and then we cut to Elgin and Ellis. Yeah, the El- only the only thing he told him is, you know, I am your friend and don't cut down the tree. Right. That's the only advice I can give you. Do not cut down the tree. So he stops. Right. Uh, Elgin is trying to downplay things. He keeps comparing it to a lost kid in a playground at one point. And Elgin, Ellis isn't buying any of this. In fact, he gets angry at yeah, the comparison. Because, you know, he's like, you're not taking this seriously. My wife is right. missing. She's not on a playground. <laughs> so, so he brings up his uh, losing his mother, which is news to Elgin. And uh, then we cut to Ethan and Jim, who goes to the RV. He's using it as an excuse to talk to Ethan. And he brings up how he blamed himself for what happened. How he didn't see the car. How, you know, he blames himself for Ethan's situation. Yeah, getting he, hurt he that thought day. he was going to lose Ethan like they lost Thomas. And he, he, Ethan says, well, that wasn't your fault. And then Jim says, well, why not? And Ethan says, because he was scared and doing the best he could. And... Jim turns that logic around on Ethan to make him realize that he is not responsible for what happened to Julie. Hey, by the way, Jim, very good parenting. Here. I know, right? Yeah, Jim's, yeah, Jim's good job. doing a great job this week. Uh, what hap- Maybe he's been taken over by an entity. Maybe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not actually Jim at all. No. I, I'm giving <laughs> The good parent entity stepped in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so he says this place, you know, uh, he wants them to blame themselves and to be scared, but they have to remember that they're all just doing their best no matter what. Yep. And they hug it out, and they go to leave the RV, because clearly Fatima is not here. But now the radio... Yes. ...that we last heard the night uh, the night Randall was taken... Right, by the cicadas. Um, the radio goes off. Yep. And it's the, uh, the Thomas voice from the phone. Yep. And uh, they decide to ignore it. Ethan says, you're right, it's not really him. Okay. This... I do not make very many critical comments... <laughs> about the creative choices that the show makes. But this whole thing with uh, fake Thomas is kind of... I want to know where it's going. I mean, if this is it, it doesn't land. Yeah. Like, it, it, 
it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't like, make any sense. Like emotional wise, emotional wise, that you you would never believe this was actually Thomas because Thomas, Thomas was, was an, an infant, infant when he died. <laughs> so there's no oh my god, that's my son's voice because you never heard your son's right. voice. Right. So this doesn't unless land. it turns around that it is Thomas. Right. So I mean. <laughs> If they're going somewhere else with this, okay. But if not, if this is the conclusion that we're uh, getting to from that storyline. And it was very confusing because on one hand, it's taunting you. Right. On the other Even hand, in this call, it's like, right. Dad, where are you going? Like, it's yeah. clearly like kind of an evil voice. Like, right. And then at the same time, it, 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 helped it was like, hey, Tabitha's on an ambulance and needs help. Right. So, wh yeah, what is this voice up to? What right. side are they on? Right. So it, it's not... it. So... If I, uh, it's one critical comment I can make about the actual creative choices that the show makes is this does not land. Well, I'm just going to say it doesn't make sense. I'm not ready yeah. to judge it yet until I know what they're doing with it. Okay. I mean, if they do something interesting with it beyond this, it's, <laughs> it seems like this was meant to be the definitive conclusion of the whole Dead Thomas thing. I, I don't know. Yeah. I I really don't understand it. Right. Like, um, it would make sense if, if uh, Thomas were an actual, like, you know, if he were five or six. Right. And then we were having this voice, and there was actually some consideration as to whether this was actually right. Thomas or not. But that's not, they, they don't believe I mean, from the start. you know, like yeah. uh, Abby Entity. Yeah. Right? Mm. Like trying to convince Boyd that this really is your dead wife giving you this advice. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work here when we're talking about a baby. Right. Um, now, I do want to point out the radio. Uh, the last time we saw the radio, it was set to channel 47. Yeah. Uh, 4 and R7. This time it's on channel 16. I don't know if that means anything, but, but it's there. Okay. Uh, 16 is a lost number. Okay. 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. Yes, yes, okay. So there's that. All right. <laughs> so uh, Jade and Henry talk, and Henry basically asks him... Ooh, you skipped a scene. Did I? Yes. Tabitha and Julie uh, go to the fruit truck. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Did you skip it all together? No, I, I have it backwards. I have that the next note. <laughs> okay, well, I'm pretty sure that happens first. Okay. Tabitha and Julie go to the fruit truck, and uh, Julie's worried that people are going to keep disappearing. Oh, I see what I did is I... You just kind of... They're going I, back and forth a lot. I inserted this note in between this when I actually meant to have this down here. Okay, well, either way. Yep. <laughs> um, it's all happening. Everybody's yep. doing things. Yep. Uh, but yeah, Tabitha and Julie are at the fruit truck. Julie's never been here before, and Tabitha's like, well, this is where we came the night that, you know, I was with Victor in the caves, and um, Julie opens up to her mom. Yep. And she tells her, like, she doesn't think she was dreaming when she blacked out. She tells her it felt like she went somewhere. And she tells her all about the chamber and, and Martin and all of that. Because she doesn't even know who Martin is. But she's like, there was some dude chained to the wall. Right. And uh, she says she was in the tunnels and she heard Tabitha and Victor there. She heard the children. She's like, she's, she's finally telling her mom all the stuff she's been on back. On uh, And as Tabitha ends up hugging Julie, she sees an on kid. And it wants her to follow. So they start to follow her. And then we cut to Jade yes. and Henry. And Henry is basically asking, why are you talking to me about uh, to me about this? Yeah, he's like, than... why are you not talking to, I don't know, literally anybody else? <laughs> right, and that's my note here, literally anyone else. Well, I think that was a direct quote. <laughs> yes. Uh, literally says, he reminds him of Victor, which Jade seems flattered by. <laughs> Do you note that Jade's reaction is basically like, oh, yeah, you think I'm like Victor? That's pretty cool. But he tells him... <laughs> That he can't fix Victor because he isn't broken. He's a product of this place. He's like Tarzan. And he and Henry is the guy who shows up to make him feel like an asshole for not knowing how to use a fork. Yeah, and you know what? It's very similar conversation to what Henry already acknowledged when he was talking to Jim. Yes. Talking about Tabitha, or yes. Miranda, rather. Right. Where he was like, you know, I was trying to fix her. I never thought maybe she's not broken. Right. It's the same thing. Well, your son's not broken either. He's right. just, you know... Changed a lot in four mm. years. Well, he, he's had to deal with a lot. He, he, I guess Henry's problem is he's trying to be a parent right. to a person he doesn't really understand. He doesn't know. Yes. Who, who's experienced things very abnormal to anything yes. anybody's ever experienced. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jade leaves him and says he's going to go back to the bar to pretend to be productive. Yeah. And it's an interesting line because it seems to acknowledge that Jade doesn't even think. That yeah. He understands doing, that yeah. he's just doing busy work mm. <laughs> and he's not really getting anywhere. <laughs> Don't choke now. Okay. No so, swallowing cicadas for you. <laughs> no, please not. <laughs> so Elgin and Ellis go to the Brundles. Yeah, again, we're getting every freaking set, and I love it. 
Elgin was really creeping me out in the scene specifically. I kind of expected him to like shiv Elgin and kill him. I thought he might drown bundles. him or something. Yeah, something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, I really, th I actually was worried for Ellis in this yeah. scene. He was giving serial killer vibes uh, in the scene. <laughs> like, oh, you're in the way. I got to take care of you. Right. But that doesn't happen. Nope. Um, he tells the story of how uh, Fatima brought him here when she was his proxy. And, you know, they talk about how great she is. Mm -hmm. And he tells Ellis that, don't worry, you're not going to lose Fatima. She's going to be okay. And, you know, Ellis doesn't want to hear any of this. Uh, Ellen uh, looks not quite convinced, uh, even at the end. But he, he seems to be more understanding yeah. of what Elgin so is trying to do. So he started just being kind of annoyed at Elgin. And by yeah. the end, I think he was appreciative of Elgin's thought, mm -hmm. even though he's not buying into it. Right. Um, and Elgin was being kind of suspicious, but he, he played it off being like, well, you know, we just don't really know all the details yet. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to worry. Yes, uh, and yeah. Because he starts talking about the baby, and Alice right. is like, well, what's the baby got to do with anything? Never mind, you know, there is no baby as far as either of them are supposed to know. Right, exactly. So uh, they decide to keep looking. Uh, this scene really creeped me the hell out when I was watching it. Like I, like I said, I was I kept expecting Elgin to, like, kill Ellis in this scene. Yeah, I, I did Reynolds. too. <laughs> so Fatima tries to dig herself out. She, she She's completely cleared the hatch door, but she still can't open mm. it. Kimono Lady appears and basically climbs on top of her and keeps her quiet. Yeah, she's covering her mouth on top of the bed. Um, because we don't know it yet, but there's somebody in the root cellar. And she's trying to keep uh, Fatima from uh, revealing her, her location. The Agui kid continues to weed them, uh, Tabitha and Jui, and weeds them to the root cellar where Victor is. Now, that's, this surprised me. Like, what, what's Victor doing here all of a sudden? Well, we learn. He's, <clears throat> he's here because he's, uh, he's sad. Yeah. And, but And he's not part of the search party, remember? He skipped the meeting, too. He was off trying to uh, trying to chop down the tree. I guess my question is, was the Agui kid leading him, leading them to Victor? Or was, was he there, were they leading him to the cellar to try to prevent the spot? You know, that's on? a good question. Yeah. I was under the impression they were trying to lead her to Fatima, but... Right. Who knows? Maybe right. they were trying to make what happens happen. Mm. Who knows? So, Victor, um, so yeah, the door's open, and they're like, oh. And Tabitha's like, wait here, I'll go down. That seems like a bad idea. Don't split up. Right. No. Have you not ever seen a horror movie? I mean, seriously, people. Uh, and as she touches the door before, you know, she went down and found Victor, she did have another one of those moments, mm -hmm. just touching the, the root cellar door. Mm. And, uh, yeah, she finds Victor, and she's like, what's going on? And, you know, nobody's hearing uh, Fatima because she's got her mouth covered. <laughs> she's trying to scream for help, but she can't. So Victor says it was his fault. Uh, his mom and his sister died. He was the one that told her mom about the tree. And that's why she left her that night. Tabitha tries to comfort him. But as she does so, she flashes back to that night. She reacts in horror as Julie and Victor look uh, on in confusion. She sees Miranda running at night, finding the bottle tree. And wouldn't you know it, who comes out from the bottle tree but... The Smiley Monster, played by Jamie McGuire. Yes, Jamie McGuire coming back. We lost, last saw him in 207. Well, you actually last saw him here on Corn Productions, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. But we last saw him in the series in episode 207, Smiley Creature. And I'm really happy they gave him a credit for this, even though mm -hmm. we didn't actually hear him speak. Right. Um... Because clearly they brought him back intentionally. They could have used any creature for this. I scene. mean, they, they, they know the phantom is yeah. in love with the smiley creature and yeah. want to see him back. It was great that we got to see him, even if it was just for a moment. He, he um, is credited as appearing in the next episode. I saw that. I don't know what that means. But... Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it means we're going to explore this history some more. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I saw that. Uh, and well, I, I can't wait to see the full extent of what that means so we can talk about it. Yes. And who knows, maybe we can even talk to Jamie about it. Yeah, so the Smiley um, Monster ends up killing Miranda. Killing Miranda. So he is the one that responsible for Miranda's, Miranda's death. Miranda's death, right outside the bottle tree. So, so yeah, the first flashback was of Miranda hugging Victor and Eloise. And again, we got... Uh, hmm, Eloise wasn't uh, credited. Okay. That actress wasn't credited, but Miranda was credited, uh, the actress Sarah Booth. We last saw her in episode 208. Gotcha. Um, and I guess, did she speak here? She maybe did. Um, I think she did. Or you know what? No, this is what it is. It's because that was a flashback scene that we've already seen, so it doesn't count. Ah, gotcha. Just like the party scene. That's gotcha. why Eloise wasn't credited, just like 
Dale and and then we're but Miranda credited. was. But Miranda, the next scene. Oh yeah, was yeah. a new scene. That is, that is a new scene. The new right. scene of Miranda and Smiley. So that's why she's credited. Hmm. Gotcha. Even though the root cellar scene was a scene we've already seen. Okay, that makes yes. sense. I just put all that together. So Tabitha um, is now completely freaking out. Yeah, she's like, "That's impossible!" And and you know, during the middle of these two scenes, she runs outside, and and uh, Victor and uh, Julie are trying to like help her, and they're like, "What the heck is going on?" And she yells at uh, she yells at her daughter. She's like, "Don't touch me!" <laughs> right. She's being really dramatic here. Well, I get it. Right. Because she just yeah. had some pretty intense feelings. Right. And that's where the episode that's ends. That's where the episode ends, and um, I wanted to keep going, and then I had to stop, and it was sad. I think this is going to add fuel to the fire. People who think that Tabitha is either Miranda uh, somehow, or um, Eloise is, is the thought that I was going with here. Right. It's going to add to that that fuel that well, she... Yeah, because clearly... Yes. Something... Yes. Something. Clearly something. Yes. I am leaning after this scene towards the reincarnation theory. I think that's what they're telling okay. us. Okay. That's actually what I was not going to bring into the conversation earlier. I mean, it's been a theory for a while. Correct. Uh, but I, I think it's coming about a lot recently because yes. of something that's could been be. leaked. Yeah. And it made me sad that that could be yeah. what and that, it's all that, been that about. Actually, but I do think the theory has pre-existed any of that. Well, it is a top theory of Kelly who's been it's, saying it's, it for Like years. I said, it's been a theory yeah. for a long time. So The two main theories yeah. about Tabitha have been she is Miranda or she is Eloise <laughs> in some respect. So uh, bringing it back to the conversation I was not going to have, but I might, I might as well now. Well, I just... From this scene, yeah. I feel like that's where they're leading, okay. regardless of any topics anybody's talking about. It so, feels like that's what they're saying. If we're going with reincarnation. It feels like that's what they're saying is she just had this memory like she was there. So I, I actually had a thought um, that, you know, we say that uh, Jade is a new Christopher. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that's literally the case? Like that right. he's a reincarnation if, of Christopher. If that's what they're going with, then right. that is, yes. But I want to take it a step even further than that. Okay. That uh, Jade is actually the reincarnation of the Civil War soldier. Of the Civil War soldier? Yes. And Could perhaps be. that's why he's splashing to him. Could and be. perhaps why that dude that uh, with the eye thing, uh, perhaps... All that, of them? Yes. Perhaps every hallucination he's seeing Could is be. a reincarnation. And that makes sense. Yeah. And my thought with Tabitha is if she is Miranda, is she... That... Every person that has been called, you know, Miranda said, lots of people have been called, summoned before me that have right. seen these visions. I mean, that would only make sense. And it, that it's always been her over and over. Right. Back to the little girl in the dream. Well, yeah. That, yeah, that's, that, that that's was her, yeah. but it was her 20, 30 lifetimes ago. Right. Um, and and that, 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 that... is that little girl one of the Ankui kids? Maybe. Is she literally one of the kids? So you think reincarnated she, reincarnation of the Yangui kids, um, and that whatever the whatever the ritual was, like the whole remember um, the story uh, Victor told that the boy in white told Christopher last week, yeah, was oh they were born in the dark and then they were killed in the dark by the people that loved them. Yes, is that these the idea is these kids were sacrificed for mm -hmm. some reason, right? And if that's what we're trying to do is save the kids, is it that their souls? were given to Frumville. Their souls were sacrificed. So they're reincarnated over and over, but they can't escape this place so they just... because this place owns their soul. So it just keeps dragging them back. So Lifetime after lifetime. If that's the case, is everybody a reincarnation? If that's the case, I would think there are seven people, seven people who that are, are reincarnates of the seven kids. And then the rest are... Are supporting cannon, players? Cannon fodder, I don't basically. know. I, I don't got this whole theory figured out. But gotcha. it... it I, I see it. Mm -hmm. And if that if that's the case, if that's where we're going with the story, I think that actually is a unique sci-fi concept. I don't think we've played with reincarnation uh, yeah. that much. Now, the other camp of people who have been pretty convinced that Tabitha literally is Eloise. Yes. I can <clears> see <throat> them seeing this scene and supporting their theory still. By saying she's not having Miranda's memory, she's having Eloise's memory. Well, because Eloise followed Miranda and perhaps saw her get killed by Smiley. She and also, she's having those memories of herself as a child watching her real mother get killed. All right. Fair enough. Now, I don't believe and... that because of the age thing. I don't follow it. 
Well, Ellie, Eloise would have died at the same time, so she could we also be a reincarnation. We don't know okay, okay. for certain that she died at the same time. That's fair. Uh, That's where that theory falls in. What I'm suggesting is she probably died around the same time. Right. And she could also then be the sure. reincarnation of Eloise and not Miranda. Could be. Right. But I don't. that seems like an extra step we don't need. <laughs> I, I can't, yeah, I see. But the theory that she literally escaped and was mm. adopted and became mm. Tabitha, if we ignore the fact that we've been told twice that uh, that Tabitha's only in her thirties and Victor's been there forty years, yeah, if we forget that and pretend she is fifty and it's cool that this could literally be her. Um, I can see that also. You know, mm. like what she's remembering is, oh, I was here as a child, and I did experience these things as a child. And except, I forgot about it. Except the problem there is that she has a mother in, in the real world right, but that, that she called. And again, I don't back this theory, but the theory mm. is that that's her adopted mother. Okay. Uh, who is Colombian, and she only has the accent because she was raised in that family. Okay. That's the theory. Gotcha. Is that that's not her real mother, that's her adopted mother. But Tabitha also kind of looks Colombian. Well, yeah, because she is. Catalina is. I mean, Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are going to, you know, but, make their theories fit. <laughs> but Elios... Or El Elios? <laughs> Eloise? Eloise. Eloise. I can't pronounce the name for some reason. Uh, she isn't necessarily, and Miranda isn't. No. So. No. I mean, yeah. I, I, again, and, I don't back this Henry, theory. Henry but it is a theory either. that a lot of people have felt pretty strongly about, and gotcha. that's what they're going to say. Oh, is absolutely. Is that this still fits. Yeah. That theory hasn't been rejected yet. Yes. Uh, in this moment. Okay. Because Eloise very well could have witnessed all this, and she could have lived and escaped, and Victor assumes she's dead because she never came back. Yeah, Because I mean, we have never talked about her body. Well, um, that would explain the connection to, uh, I mean, either way, either if we're talking, if we're saying that she's the reincarnation of Miranda, that would explain the connection between Victor and Tabitha. Oh, yeah. And if she's El El Eloise... That would also, once again, explain that same connection. That's been evident since season two. Right. So, yeah. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. And I really want to watch the last episode. And now we can. Um, and then we're going to have a whole year to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, one more episode. And then we're done with se uh, from season three. Yes. Now, hopefully, we can still bring some great content. Yep. Um, definitely some people we want to get on and talk to. So yep, absolutely. hopefully we're going to do that. I don't want to talk too much about it because we don't have anything specifically Set confirmed. Stone. Yeah. But we're talking to some people and yeah. you know, we might have some interviews. So that would yep. be great. Um, Smiley. Yes. So again, I was super excited that, um, he, that Jamie got a credit because love seeing Jamie. Glad that we got to see his face again and, and possibly we're going to get some more of him in the next episode. So we'll get to talk more about Jamie, but what this scene tells us about Smiley is that he existed back when he Miranda was Smiley was... Right. in the 70s. Right. So these creatures that we know now are the same creatures that have been there at least since then. Yeah. Which is, it's news. It's an answer. It's a confirmation of something because we didn't know that for certain before. Mm -hmm. There was kind of a theory like, oh, are all these creatures people who died in Victor's time? Well, that would... No, because they were the same creatures. We know we, I think we had a theory at one point that the... The current townspeople eventually become the new monsters, right. and, that, and that's a cycle. Right. This would seem to reject that that, yeah. that theory. It does yeah. seem to reject that theory. Mm. And, you know, this makes it sound, seem more cemented that they're all dressed in 50s and 60s clothing because they've been creatures since the 50s or 60s. Right. Like the same creatures. Mm -hmm. Um. And if they were human, which is what Christy believes, that they were human once, it was a very long time ago. I mean, maybe even longer than that, because they could just as easily update their wardrobe. Right, like, we don't know, <laughs> but we know for certain now yeah. the same creatures were there when Victor was a kid. Mm -hmm. He's been literally seeing the same creatures his whole life. Gotcha. Yeah. Which is something. It is something. It's something. I don't know what, but it's something. Right. <laughs> it is, it's, it's an answer. Yes. I don't know what it's an answer to, but it's some concrete... Yeah. Thing. By the way, of this episode, as of this episode, we have had at least one answer to something, uh, the rope thing. So they have answered one question. One big question. <laughs> so you can no longer say in the groups, 
that uh, they have not answered any questions. I mean, because... that's the thing. They're always answering questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not always going to be spelled out for you. Right. You know, and I'll bring up this example. We... It's a very small detail, but people are like, where'd Victor get all the peaches? Mm. That was answered at the beginning of season two. We got a peach truck. Yes. Whole truck of peaches that existed. Yep. And people aren't picking up on those details mm -hmm. because there's not literally a line of dialogue that says, yes, this is the truck that brought in 80 cases of peaches I've been eating on for the last 40 years. Yeah. I mean, we've certainly brought this up before that this show does not do handholding. Right. So you have to be able to sort these things and, and, and put the pieces together. Yes. Yourself, right. basically. And I still want to talk more about the freaking bracelet. Yeah. No matter where we're going with this, it's not explaining the bracelet to me. So they better come back and explain the bracelet. Well, um... And how it exists in four different ways now. Well, we had previously <laughs> speculated that Miranda would see had been seeing visions sure. of Tabitha's bracelet. And if she is, in fact, the reincarnation of... Uh, or she's the predecessor to Tabitha's reincarnation, yeah. if that makes any sense at all. I don't know. Then, then she made the bracelet more than once. Yes. But it still doesn't explain how both Henry had it at home and Miranda had it in From. Yeah. And how uh, Jim lost it at the hospital and it's in the diner. Right. There's four different instances of it. So even if we have two totally separate bracelets that were made at two different lifetimes, it's still not explaining how all of it comes together. Right. There's, there's more to the bracelet. And yeah. because uh, Julie throwing the rope did introduce a time element, I'm still waiting for there to be some timey-wimey stuff going on. All right. Well, I, I don't know where or what, but I'm waiting right. for it. I'm waiting for timey-wimey. Well, we got, there's got to be more to that. We got one more episode to go. Uh, and and what the heck is in the secret room in the root cellar? I mean, I, I think that has to come into play. It's got in something episode. down there is important. Yes. I mean, they're, they're bringing up... <laughs> it has to come into play next episode. Uh, that, right. That particular mystery. Yeah. Whether the bracelet thing is solved next episode I mean, episode I, I'm half but... expecting it to be, you know, a, a room with a timer in it, like Lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what was under their hatch. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what's going to pop out of Fatima? Something's popping out nothing, next episode. Nothing good. Something is coming out of that woman. I mean, Jamie McGuire's uh, credited in the next hey, episode. Hey, I've been joking that she's going to give yes. birth to Jamie McGuire since we found out she was <laughs> pregnant. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. So. Um, and, you know, on that, I was literally just put this together recently. That theory's, you know, been going around that the reason she became pregnant is because they killed a creature and now a new creature has to be born. Yeah. That she was, was pregnant. She found out she was pregnant before Smiley died. Okay. I, I, just, wasn't. I just recently put that together because people have been talking about like, oh, she got pregnant because of the worm thing. And they were like, well, no, she was pregnant before that night, which is true. It was earlier in that day that Christy confirmed she was pregnant. Okay. Before Boyd transferred the worms to Smiley. Smiley and then Smiley And then died. transferred his blood to Ellis because people were suggesting, oh, she's pregnant with a, with a creature because uh, Ellis still got the worms and, and impregnated her. And they were like, well, no, she was already pregnant. Which also means she was already pregnant before Smiley died. Interesting. So it's not literally that he died and it's being replaced. Okay. Because she was pregnant before that. Okay. So I don't think that's what's going on. Okay. Like explicitly a monster replacement deal. Right. All and, right. you know, the kimono woman. like, What is that well, about? Right. Obviously, the baby's got something to do with her specifically. Elgin was like, it's not your baby. Is it Kimona Woman's baby? Mm -hmm. Is it Kimona Woman herself? I mean, I don't know what's going on. Was Kimona Woman a pregnant woman at one point? Is I, Fatima I would... the reincarnation of Kimona Woman? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, I would imagine that they would have to wrap up the whole pregnancy thing and what this, this baby is in the finale. They Maybe, have to. Maybe she's about to give birth to the ballerina. Maybe, perhaps. Because <laughs> I'm still waiting to figure out what the heck that was about to. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, yeah, but what's what what's under that door? Something. And they better tell us. Yeah, they, they have to. Um, 
There, there are certain things that they cannot get away with not telling us in the and finale. I don't think Fatima's going to live through this. I also don't think Elgin is going to live through this. Um, or if he, he's very weak, he's not going to be a very popular Again, the guy. voice has told Sarah they can't save her. That means she's in mortal danger. Uh -huh. Either she's dying or she's turning into a creature. Right. I don't think she... Fatima survives this. Even though Elgin is being lied to so and told by might... Kimono Woman, she's going to be cool. So it, it's quite possible that uh, next season we're still going to see fatima as like as a monster a creature. creature that would be the... creepy and cool i think yeah and I, I can see the emotional ramifications of doing something like that for sure but uh yeah so much going on there is and again it feels like it's all starting to kind of piece together a little bit yeah still still having trouble grasping onto it exactly yes and there's yeah there. there uh, the finale is going to be very interesting, I think. Yes. I think it's going to be really cool. And I think it's going to set up so many more questions, too. <laughs> I'm sure. And, you know, uh, it could cap off a great season if it's a great finale. Yeah. Like, and I think it has been a great season. Yeah. Yeah. A, lot, a, lot a of people, couple of the episodes are yeah. a little slower. And yes. that's to be expected. Yeah. There's all a, in all, it's been a fabulous season. Uh, yep. That's my perspective. I know there's some people who disagree with me. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, <sighs> taking it back a minute... Um, this, these same people who were like, oh, season three sucks, but season one and two were great. We're the same people who were saying season two sucks as well. Yes. So I'm not taking them seriously. I'm right. sorry. And it's the people, specifically, mm. I'm pretty certain of this, that want to binge watch. Mm. They can't handle watching week to week. And that is the core problem. Yeah. Because when they watch the season back in its entirety, they're like, oh, that was great. Yeah. But when they're watching one, like you said, one chapter at a time, mm. they don't know how to process that. I, I still want to know who represents the fandom more, us or them. Well, hopefully people who actually like the show and want it to continue. Yes. Because if the naysayers get this show canceled, I'm never going to forgive them. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. All right, do we have anything else to say about this episode? I think we covered it, and I can't wait to come back next week and talk about the season finale. Hey, you and I can go just watch the finale right now. <laughs> All right, uh, so we'd like to hear from you. What do you think uh, of the podcast? What do you think is going on? What do you, uh, what do you think of the season? Stacey can be reached at. I can reach on Twitter, X, Instagram, and threads at TV n coupon talk if you like this video and want to support the channel there are a number of ways to do so you can follow me on twitter at core productions you can join one of my corn productions facebook pages you can buy something from the corn production store on zazzle you can buy me a coffee you can join the corn productions membership for 99 cents a month and of course you can like share and comment on this video as well as subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell so you're notified when new content drops this is dave and stacy from corn productions signing off